Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Close Oppenheimer, president of the Salisbury Forum. And on behalf of the Forum Board, I want to welcome everybody here tonight. Uh, as you, as you, many of you may know, we are now in the midst of our annual appeal. And for anyone in this audience who has given us a donation, we're extremely grateful. Uh, we depend on our audience to help us fund the majority of our programs. And if you have not given us a donation, I hope you'll consider doing so today or, or sometime soon. There should be uh, donation envelopes in the lobby and uh, you can also make an easy online donation by just going to our website. We have some terrific speakers lined up for 2020. The next event that we're going to be hosting is um, at the Movie House on January 26th. We'll be screening a documentary film called Parkland Rising. And it uh, focuses on the students uh, that were affected by the mass shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida on Ma Valentine's Day 2018. And uh, these are an impressive bunch of kids, you've probably seen them all over the news, who have become real activists in the uh, gun safety issue and trying to promote sane and reasonable gun safety laws. So I hope you'll join us for that. And we are very pleased to have James Foreman Jr. here with us tonight. He has an impressive background, both academically and uh, business-wise, in terms of being a uh, public defender, which uh, introduced him to this topic of his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Locking Up Our Own Crime and Punishment in Black America. And he has now been uh, teaching at Yale University so um, I think he can take it from here. I hope you'll all join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, to all of the, the members of the, the board um, and those of you that support this organization. It's a real honor to be here and I wanna thank each of you all for coming out tonight. Your, your decision to be here, it's important and it says something about the way this conversation is going in this country that um, a room full of folks would decide that you wanna come and talk about the problem of mass incarceration and the problem of uh, changing our criminal justice system. It's a special, of honor for me to be here in Salisbury because Salisbury, as it turns out, has a, has a particular place in, in, in my life. Uh, so my wife, uh, Ifi, um, is, uh, she's, her father's Nigerian and her mom is from the US and she spent the first six years of her life in Nigeria and then when her parents split up, her mom brought the kids all back to the US and when she came back, uh, Ifi's mom, my wife's mom, decided to move back in with her mother, who had, by this point, moved to Salisbury, Connecticut. So my wife's first exposure to the United States after, after a childhood in Nigeria was Salisbury. And I won't say that it was perfect for her, but it was really good in a lot of ways. And um, so when I, heard, when I heard that I was gonna have, have the opportunity to come here, she's, She's very sorry that she can't be here tonight to relive some of her history. She's, uh, our son plays in a youth basketball team that I coach, so I should be there too, um, but she's my stand-in tonight um, at his game in New Haven. Uh, and there's still a family connection to this area because uh, Ify's aunt, uh, Marty, uh, and, and Uncle Murray are here in the audience. They live in Millerton, uh, New York, so I feel, I feel very much welcome and I feel very much at home uh, in this space. I, thank you. I mean, this is a heavy, it's a heavy day to be, to be here. It's a heavy time right now in our country. We have only for the fourth time in American history have had impeachment proceedings uh, convened. Uh, in the midst of those proceedings today, as a, as a career uh, diplomat was, I think, uh, very bravely testifying. Um, she was confronted 
um, with further intimidation uh, from the White House. And I think that we're at a scary time in our country's history. I don't think any of us knows exactly where this is going to go. Um, and I think in those moments of fear, um, it can, we can be tempted to feel um, powerless. Um, and while it's not the main um, thrust of my talk, I did want to acknowledge um, what's happening in the country at this moment. Uh, and I do want to say that there's an organization that I'm very excited about that whenever I feel like angry and I want to throw my remote control at the te television about what's happening in Washington, I just go online and I give them like another $20 donation. Um, and y'all probably have organizations like this yourself. And um, so if you do, please uh, keep doing that. Um, and if you don't, uh, the one that I've been giving money to lately is an organization called Run For Something. Um, and what they do is they basically support uh, young, uh, young people, uh, people of color, women, um, people from historic economically marginalized groups, basically people who don't normally run for office. And they persuade them that running for office is worth it. They and then they support them in their campaigns. And in this last uh, election, just you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, over 50% of the candidates that they supported Many of them long shots because of their youth or because of their, their kind of outlier status, uh, they won. And I think, and they're running people for city council races and county council races and school board races. They're doing the very bottom up building of a new generation, a new cohort of leadership that I think is going to be the leadership that we're going to need um, to move us out of the stalemate and the, the morass. Uh, and the horror in many ways that, we're, that we face right now. So support Run for Something or support the organization of your choice, um, but, but please keep supporting uh, these fighters for change. I wanted to talk now about my work and my research and what the conversation that, that brings me here uh, before you tonight. And I thought the place that I should start is in a way the place that all of us start which is, you know, what brought us to the work that we're doing? What, what brought me uh, to be here now? And that story is also a story that I tell in, in the book. Um, and there are a lot of ways into it, but I think the way that I'll start is the story of a young man that I represented named Brandon. Brandon was a teenage client of mine, 16 years old, Washington, D.C., Superior Court, and he was facing sentencing. He had been charged with and had pled guilty to possession of a gun and possession of a small amount of marijuana. And now he was going to be sentenced. And I was his lawyer. I was his public defender. And I had taken the job of being a public defender because I viewed it as then, as I view it now, I viewed mass incarceration as the civil rights issue of my generation. My parents met in the original civil rights movement. My parents met in SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. My dad was the executive secretary. My mom was a member of the organization. They're an interracial couple. My dad's black, my mom's white. And their generation, right, they changed and transformed this nation. I say their generation, by the way. I know there's some people in the audience who are part of this generation. So when I say their, for all of you all that are part of this generation, I want you to hear me as saying your. You know, their generation, your generation, um, they became a couple when, when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. And they transformed the nation. They brought us the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 68. I mean, Congress passed those laws, President signed them, yes. But the only reason anybody in Washington acted is because people marched and people protested and people demanded and people were arrested. 
And what they did was revolutionary. They made it possible for a black man of my generation to have opportunities that were unimaginable in previous generations. And yet and still, even with all the change that they produced, I could see when I was graduating law school that there was this unfinished business to the movement. And I'm not saying this is the only place where there's unfinished business, but the place that I saw the unfinished business was in our criminal legal system. You'll hear me in the book, I call it the criminal justice system, and you'll hear me go back and forth. But more and more, like, I'm using the term criminal legal system because it feels like a system that has so little justice in it doesn't deserve to have the name and the title. So when I was gradu graduating law school, we didn't even yet have the term mass incarceration. That was a term created in the year 2000 by activists and advocates trying to describe this phenomenon. We didn't have the term, but we already had some of the underlying statistics. We already knew that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. We already knew that black women at the time were the largest growing part of our prison system. We already had passed Russia and South Africa to earn the dishonor of being the world's largest jailer. We already had 5% of the world's population and yet 25% of its prisoners. And I had seen some of the changes and transformations in American society to produce those numbers. I had seen some of them in the trajectory of my own life. I grew up in Atlanta in a mostly African American, working class, borderline middle class in pockets neighborhood. And in my neighborhood as a child, if you walked out my front door and you went down to the corner, you turned right, you went two blocks, you got to one enormous building. If you walked down to that same corner and turned left and walked two blocks, you got to another enormous building. You turned right, you got to a General Motors plant. If you turned left, you got to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. That's when I was a kid. Now, fast forward 15 years. I'm graduating law school, deciding what I'm going to do with my career. In that 15 years, one of those buildings had shut down, doors padlocked, jobs shipped overseas. And the other building had built an addition, an extra wing. I don't think I need to tell anybody in the audience which is which, but if I do, come, come see me afterwards. And <laughs> you only have to bring a book, I'll just tell you. So that's why I was a public defender. That's why I was in Superior Court standing next to Brandon, asking for him to be put on probation. I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor at his school. It was his first arrest. His mother and grandmother were there in court in the first row. They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor in the case, she wanted him to go to a place called Oak Hill. Now, Oak Hill is like a lot of juvenile facilities in this country. It combines a very nice sounding name, you know, what could be better than an oak tree on a hill, with a violent and brutal reality. It was a place where there were no meaningful programs. It was a place where drugs and violence were rampant. It was a place where, as a child, you always left worse off than when you entered. The judge that had to make the decision in the case, Curtis Walker, not his real name. I changed the names of everybody to protect the identity of my client. But he was a real judge. He's an African-American judge. About 40% of the Superior Court judges in Washington, D.C. were African-American. He looks out in the courtroom. What does he see? He sees a young black man facing sentencing, black defense lawyer, black prosecutor. And he looks at Brandon. And he says, son... Mr. Foreman's been telling me that you've had a tough life. You deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. See, the judge had been a child in those years. So he proceeded to lecture Brandon on what it was like. And then he says, so here's the thing, son. People fought. People marched. People died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on, embarrassing your family, embarrassing your community, carrying that gun. 
So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. He said, I hope one day you turn it around. But today in this courtroom, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. They locked him up. And I was so furious, so frustrated. I mean, think about it. The judge had just taken the same history, the same decade, the same heroes that I told you motivated me to become a public defender. And he had twisted them around in this moral rationalization for why it made sense to lock up Brandon. As I began to work through my anger at the judge, and I'm still in process on that, but as I began to work through it, I began to reflect on the fact that the judge wasn't alone in this way. I told you about 40% of the judges in Washington, D.C. Superior Court were black. Well, the city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was being sentenced under was a majority black city council. And our police force was majority black, our police chief was black, our mayor was black, our chief prosecutor in the city at the time was none other than Eric Holder, before he would become famous nationally. And even with all that representation in local government, in this majority black community, with some measure of control of our local politics, what were we doing? We were making the same choices, the same mandatory minimums, the same stop and frisk, the same excessive, excessive sentences, the same dysfunctional prisons. We were doing the same thing that the rest of the country was doing, and with the same results. One in three young black men under criminal justice supervision nationally in DC, it was one in two at the time. And so I really began to reflect on this question, how did this come to be? How, what was so powerful, so all-consuming, so omnipresent in this country that even in this majority black community, we would make so many of the same policy choices? That's the question of the book. How did this come to be? Now, I can't answer that question in the time that we have together. I'll do my best uh, to give you some of the highlights. Uh, there is a solution. There is an answer. It's outside in the... Uh, in the book there. But let me give you a couple of the highlights. The first thing to understand is rising crime and violence and the fear and the anger that it generated throughout this country, but particularly in black communities, which is my point of focus. In throughout 50 years, but especially in the 1960s and 1980s. Now, in 1980s are the crack cocaine years. People remember them better. I'm not going to mention them, but let me tell you about the 1960s. Because in the 1960s, heroin did to black communities what crack would do two decades later. The homicide rate in this country doubled in the 1960s. It tripled in Washington, D.C. And heroin, they tested everybody entering the D.C. jail for substances every year, every month, every day. In 1964, they found that 4% of the people entering the jail were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% had become 45%. That's an epidemic. And it wasn't just that, but it was the response that it generated. So I was fortunate to be able to write this book. I came across some really treasure trove, some archives of local elected officials who, when they retired, just dumped all their papers on some local libraries. And fortunately for me, a number of them kept not just their official proclamations, but the letters they received from citizens. So it's this, beautiful, it's this amazing social history. So this is 1970. We're talking about Washington, D.C., 70% black city at the time, called it Chocolate City. So these are black elected officials, writing, black citizens writing to black elected officials. 11 of the 13 city council in D.C.'s first city council are African American. And these letters reveal a pain and an anguish. People say, we've just fought the civil rights movement, and I'm scared to take my kids to school. People say, I feel like a stranger in my own city streets. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. And these letters end, always end with some version of do something, do something. You've got to do something about this. Now, who's receiving these letters? That's the second big argument in the book. 
The generation of people receiving these letters is the first generation of black elected officials to be elected in any number in this country since Reconstruction. 1970s, 1980s, we get an 800% increase in black elected officials in this country. It's an 800% increase over almost zero, but it's an 800% increase, and it's because of the Voting Rights Act of 65. What do we know about this generation? A lot of them were from the South. Some of them were in the Civil Rights Movement with my parents. All of them remember the long history of under-enforcement and under-protection of the law that has been part of the black experience in this country since slavery. My dad used to tell me about this. My dad grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi, Jim Crow, south side of Chicago. He used to say, he called me my brother, man. He said, man, we didn't call the police in our neighborhood, a black neighborhood under Jim Crow when there was a crime. The police weren't going to come respond to black victims. And if they came, the only thing you could be sure of is they were going to make matters worse. This generation, they remember Southern sheriffs in cahoots with the Klan asked about homicide in the black neighborhood. Said, oh, that's not a homicide. That's another dead black person. And they didn't use the words black person. So they remember this history. They're shaped by it. And now they're in office, some measure of control of local government. And with that power, they want to try to make sure that the police and the law enforcement apparatus responds to those black citizens who are writing those letters asking for protection. OK, so crime is rising. People are scared. They're asking for protection. And a generation of black elected officials, some of them want to respond. But why police? Why prosecutors? Why prisons? Why is that the response? that could the community get. And here's where, even though my research is focused on black communities, black elected officials, black politics, black intellectual, social, cultural history, any book that is about the black community in this country also has to be a book about the larger society, the larger system, the larger culture, the larger history, the larger politics that constrains and limits the options that are available to black communities and their elected officials. Let me mention a couple of those constraints. The first constraint is historical. Black elected officials, that first generation, and still to this day, have been elected to represent communities that because of a history of racism in law, a history of racism that began with slavery, which we should never forget. We had in this country for longer than we haven't. And I don't mean metaphorical, I mean actual slavery. 1619, first blacks arrived in this country to 1865, is more years than 1865 to the present. And then that's followed up by Jim Crow, white supremacy in law. So for 80 to 90 percent of American history, it was the established government policy written in law to suppress and to degradate and to exploit and to diminish black communities. So because of that history, right, which had very particular and concrete policy implications, it's not just a theoretical point. What does it mean to have that in law? It means that if you're a black citizen and you go to fight in World War II and you come back and you're supposed to get the benefits of the GI Bill, you don't get them because of racism and how those benefits are administered. It means that if you're a black family in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and you're trying to get a home loan to improve your home, you can't get it because of wealth discrimination and redlining. And as a result, black families are not able to build up wealth over generations, the kind of wealth that people whose families could do that take for granted, the kind of wealth that helps people pay for sending their kids to a school like this, pay for college, pay for that down payment on the first house. 
It means that when we built the federal highways in this country, we built a massive Eisenhower led it highway system, inter the interstate highway that we all take for granted. Well, those highways had to be put somewhere. Where were they put? In city after city, they were put through the middle of the neighborhoods with the least political power, black neighborhoods. So just give you Atlanta as an example. Who's driven through Atlanta? If you've driven through Atlanta, you've driven on I-75 or I-85, almost certainly. And you don't know it, but right before you get to downtown, you drive through what was once called the Black Wall Street, a thriving, robust black community. Dr. King was raised there. Devastated when they put a federal highway through the middle of it. So because of this history of choices in law and policy, black elected officials that come into office have been elected to represent communities that lack the resources to protect themselves. So they're over-reliant on the state. They're over-reliant on police. They're over-reliant on prosecutors. They're over-reliant on prisons to provide that protection. The second constraint is political. Black political power in this country has always been concentrated locally. City council, mayor's office, county council. And local, po local politics is important, I argue, for how we got mass incarceration and how we have to respond to it. But there are limits to what local government can do. And you see in my book example after example of these limits. For the last 50 years, black elected officials have had what I call an all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence. They've said, we want more police and more prosecutors, and sometimes, unfortunately, some of them even said we want more prisons. But they've also said, we want more money for drug treatment. We want more money for housing. We want more money for schools. We want more money for jobs. We want more money for mental health. They've gone to Congress asking for money for all of the above. And for 50 years, every year, they come back with money for one of the above, law enforcement, police, and prosecutors. And the last constraint that I'll mention, and it's one that we still suffer from today, although there is a generation, uh, a new generation that is beginning to liberate us from this, but the last constraint is that this is a generation that I write about in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. They were constrained by their imagination in how to respond to what were real, pressing, genuine social problems. So what do I mean by this? Well, let me give you an example. One of the people that I write about is a guy named David Clark. David Clark, fascinating character. I told you all that 11 of 13 members of that first city council were African American. David Clark is one of the two white members. He had an unusual biography. He went to Howard University Law School in the 1960s, worked for Dr. King, becomes a lawyer for poor people, gets elected to city council. Now, for these purposes, what you need to know about David Clark is that he was not a drug warrior. In fact, the first piece of legislation that he pushed when he got into office in 1975 was marijuana decriminalization. He was before his time. It almost passed. It didn't, but he fought the fight. Okay, so he's not a drug warrior. Now, early 1980s, I told you about heroin in the 60s. Early 1980s, heroin comes back. It's more potent, there's more overdose deaths, there's more violence. And all of a sudden you see an uptick in letters to the city council and they're all focused on heroin addicts. These letters say, I don't endorse this language, but it's what the letters say, that these junkies are nodding off on the stoops, they're leaving syringes in the alley, they're gathering on the park benches, they're gathering on the corner, my kids are not safe. And over and over again, the letters end with some version of do something, do something. We have to do something about this. So David Clark gets these letters, responsible government official that he is. He forwards them to the head of the relevant government agency. And each time you can see the correspondence, he gets a letter back. Council Member Clark, we receive your complaint about heroin addicts. We're on the case. Now. Who does he forward the letters to? Remember the problem stated in the letters is heroin addicts in public. That's the problem. 
So does he forward the letters to the addiction services, mental health, social work, treatment? Y'all are medical. You know who he forwards them to. He forwards them to the police chief. Because even though he's not a drug warrior, he's an American. And like the rest of us, his imagination has been so constrained. He can only think of when faced with a problem of heroin addicts in public and citizen complaints about it, he can only think of sending somebody whose only tools are handcuffs and a gun and only place they can take you for treatment where there is none is the local jail. And one of the arguments in my book is that to understand how we got to mass incarceration and crucially to understand how we can destroy it, and rebuild a new system. It is tempting to look at speeches of Congress, speeches of presidents, acts of Congress, and those matter. But it is just as important that we look at the small decisions, decisions made under the radar, decisions made across the 50 states and 3,000 counties that make up the United States, decisions, some of them made by well-meaning people like David Clark, Decisions like, which government agency do I list for support when I'm confronted with citizen complaints about drug addicts? And that it's those small decisions that are the individual bricks that collectively, on top of one another, have built the prison nation that the United States has become. Now, when I, when I go to these, you know, I'm like y'all, I'm always attracted to the social justice type lectures. And but some of y'all are thinking, I, you know, I just go to the Salisbury Forum. I take whatever they can get. I wasn't, I wasn't counting on social justice. And, but I always go to those kind of lectures. And one of the things that I always find and that I'm sometimes frustrated by is somebody comes and they present their work in in hopefully gripping detail. And when they finish depressing the audience, they close their PowerPoint slide and they're like, my work is done and they walk off stage. And I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, you're welcome. <laughs> and I wanna spend the last time that we have together talking about the future, the present and the future. I wanna talk about what we can do right now. And the first thing that I want to share with you is not a specific policy prescription, but it's a way of thinking about the problem. And it comes from a conversation that I had with my mother. I was in 10th grade. I had just moved to a new high school. I was always going to a new high school. There are a lot of great things about being a child of civil rights workers. St residential and educational stability not being on the list. <laughs> so, I, so it was a new school, and I was in the bathroom, first or second day of school, and I saw something that really upset me. And it was, it was bullying. It wasn't physical, but it was verbal, and it was, it, was, it, was, it was terrible. And I didn't really have the words at the time to explain what I know now, which is that this one child was being, being bullied because of his emerging gender identity. But I knew it was wrong, and I knew it made me upset. I went home, and I told my mom about what I had seen. And I had ideas for what the principal could do, the assistant principal, how they could make the school safer. I had ideas for what my mom could do. My mom was on one of these moms, and I know there's nobody out here who was ever like this, but she was one of these moms that was always up in the school about everything. And... I didn't want her to be there. <laughs> and I was like, OK, now you're invited. I want you to do something about this. And she listened to me give these ideas. And she said, well, I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing this. I'm glad you told me about it. She's like, and I'm glad you have ideas about what I can do. She said, I just have one question for you. And y'all, many of y'all have been parents. So you probably know where she was going with this. I did not. She said, my only question is, what are you going to do? 
What are you going to do about it? And what my mom was telling me was powerful. She was telling me, never give up your power. Never give up your ability to influence what's going to happen in your community tomorrow and the next day. And this problem of mass incarceration is a problem that we have to think, I think we have to think about in that way. Because it is fundamentally a local problem. DC gets the focus. But 88% of prisoners in this country are in state, county, and local prisons. That means that the most powerful actors are in Hartford. They're in Albany. The most powerful actors are at the county level, the county district attorney, who has more power than any official to determine how many people from that county go to prison. And so the good news for me is I feel like that's a, that's a piece I can touch. That's something I can control. That's, that's something that I and some other citizens can get together and actually have some real and direct influence over. So with my mom's admonition, okay, what are you going to do about it in my head? I started thinking about my response. I'm a professor. You know, you know I teach at Yale, and I'm privileged to teach wonderful students. I have one of the greatest jobs in the world. But I started thinking about how we gutted prison education in this country. In the 1990s, Congress eliminated Pell Grants which meant that you could no longer get any financial aid to study while you were incarcerated, prison education left. And so I got trained in a program called Inside Out Prison Exchange. And what Inside Out Prison Exchange does is it trains professors in any subject matter. I happen to do criminal justice law, but it doesn't matter the subject matter. They train professors to teach the classes that you would normally teach in your home university inside of a prison. And here's the kicker. The classroom is made up of half students who are incarcerated and half students from your home university. So now every week I travel to Carl Robinson Prison in Enfield, Connecticut in the fall and to the Federal Women's Prison in Danbury, Connecticut in the spring with eight students from Yale and four students from Quinnipiac and 12 students who are incarcerated, and we sit in a circle, in a seminar, inside the prison library or whatever space they'll give us, and we study the criminal legal system. And it is the most powerful teaching that I ever get to do. You can imagine for the law students, right? who normally are being confronted with dry texts, descriptions of the legal system written by judges, and now they're sitting in a seminar circle with somebody who's experienced it directly. But for the incarcerated students, the research shows that for every dollar we invest in education for somebody who's incarcerated, we get $5 in return. And that return comes from recidivism rates go down and employment rates go up. But I don't need, that was the Rand Corporation studied that and concluded that. And I didn't even need that study to see the impact that this can have. I see it in my own students. At the end of the final evaluation two semesters ago, one of the students wrote in his final eval, he said, I like the law and the policy that we learned in this class. I did. But he said, what I really liked is that every week, when I would walk into the prison library and I would approach the seminar circle, I knew that I was walking into a space where I was going to be treated like I had ideas, where I was going to be treated like I was smart, where I was going to be treated like, and on some days I would even feel like an intellectual. And prison is the opposite of that. And so what I try to do, he said, is I try to take this feeling for this two hours and I try to make it like a little protective bubble around me to carry me through the rest of the week before I come back to seminar. I'm not saying that all y'all need to go teach in prisons, although I hope some of you will. 
there's other kinds of programs that you can get involved with that don't even in getting involved with education in, with incarcerated um, students that don't involve going into prison. On my website, I have a take, which is jamesformanjr.com, I have a take action page. And the take action page directs you to resources on a bunch of the topics of the things that I'm going to talk about. So let me just mention that because I might not be able, I know I won't be able to touch on everything that anybody can do, but my website has additional ideas. I'm on, for those of you that are on social media, I'm on Twitter at Jay Foreman Jr. I talk about some of these ideas there as, is there as well. Let me say though, let me talk about something else that doesn't involve you having to get into a prison. This is gonna come right to you. It's gonna come actually right to your home, which is this. I want everybody just to think about, I'm not gonna ask anybody to raise their hands, but just think about the last time the jury summons came to your house. And I want you to try to reflect on the emotion that you had when you saw that letter on the pile of bills. Now, if you're like most people, it was something between like dread and, oh gosh, how'd they get me already again? I just got this a couple years ago. And what can I do to get out of it? Let me call my friend who's a lawyer. Hey, how do you get out of jury service? That's how most people react. And what I want to ask you all, the kind of people that would come to an event like this and listen to a talk like this and not walk out, I want to ask you to embrace that notice. You don't have to be like me and like run down to the courthouse and be like the first one there before they even open the courthouse doors. That's a little bit extreme. But I want you to embrace this as an opportunity to raise your voice about the system because during Reconstruction, when black citizens fought for the right to vote, black citizens and white allies, they fought the, for the right to vote in two places, the ballot box, which we know of, and the jury box, which was also understood as a crucial site of democracy. And you can see, if you follow the news, you can see case after case after case where who's on the jury and what voices are on the jury makes a difference in the outcome, whether it's the grand jury or the pettit jury. And what frustrates me is, in my experience as a public defender, is so many people who are critical of the system are the ones who, when it comes time to pick a jury, are the first ones trying to figure out how they can get off. I was talking to a woman at a protest in New Haven not that long ago. She had an end mass incarceration sign. And I was talk and I had not that long ago got my notice to serve, and I wanted to talk, I was talking to her about jury service as a way to try to help end mass incarceration. She said, Oh no, no, I could never serve. The system is corrupt. Right. Okay, good. I'm glad y'all had that reaction. Because this is the reaction that I want to engender and instill and encourage and have us talk about. Which is that if all the people that think the system is wrong or the system is corrupt, or the system is unfair, or the system is racist, if all those people take themselves out of jury service, then we're going to be left with juries that think that mass incarceration is OK, that think it's OK to have the largest prison system in the history of the world. And that system is going to just keep perpetuating itself. So get that notice, tear it open, mark down the date on your calendar, and get down there and go ask the hard questions. Go ask the hard questions. Let me talk about another way, another area in which folks can make a difference, because you might say, all right, but it's going to be a long time. You know, I'm not an educator, so I can't do the inside out thing. I, it's going to be a long time until I get my notice, to, my, my notice to serve. So let me talk to you about something else that you can definitely do. And it has to do with jobs. So like I said before, those of us the place that I think we can make the most difference is local. The place where we can mo play, make the most difference is in the areas that we can control. 
So for those of you that are employers or no employers or work in a company or know people who work in a company if you're retired from that company, I want to talk to you about fair chance employment. Because the biggest obstacle, the two biggest obstacles that people who are incarcerated have is education and employment. When you get out, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of restrictions that mean that you can't get a job after you've been released from prison. So the debt, you never can stop paying it. It's a lifetime punishment. And some of these restrictions are crazy. And in a number of states, we, you can't get a license to be a barber if you have a criminal conviction. In California, whenever you see those wildfires in California, odds are that there's somebody from a prison that's, that's fighting those fires because California relies on prison labor as firefighters. Well, that's okay. People should be paid adequately, but that's okay. But here's the thing. When you get out of prison in California, you can't be certified to be a firefighter because of your criminal conviction. So you can fight fires while you're in prison, but can't get a job as a firefighter when you get out. This is just a couple of examples of the enormous burdens, the wall of no's that face people who come out from being incarcerated. The Ford Foundation does amazing work on criminal justice reform. And a couple of years ago, they were doing a presentation at a prison in New York State. And the leadership of the Ford Foundation was there. Darren Walker even was there. And they had presented on their work. And they finished presenting. And one of the men raised his hand. And he said, thank you for this presentation and for the work that you're doing around the world. I just have one question. What's that? When I get out, could I be hired at the Ford Foundation? Not like, would you hire me, but would it even ever be possible for somebody like me to be hired? And there was silence in the room. Because like most people, they didn't know the answer to that question. Because like most people, they didn't know the specifics and the details of their human resources policy. But to their credit, they went and they found out. And the answer, like most employers, was no. That resume never even would have made it through the screening. It would have never landed on the desk of somebody in a position to consider making the hiring decision. To their further credit, the Ford Foundation scrubbed their HR policies from top to bottom. They got rid of about 90% of the exclusions. Not every single one, but they got rid of most of them. And to their further credit, they set up an internship program, a paid internship program, where they go out and they recruit people that have criminal records. They bring them in, and they say, if you succeed and you do well, we will consider hiring you full time. Now, anybody can do that. And it used to be 10 years ago that people would say, well, I don't know. I don't know. How do I become a fair chance employer? Well, now we have the answer. There's an organization called the National Employment Law Project. Again, I put their resources and all these other things for on my website if you're interested or just go directly to the National Employment Law Project. Specific toolkit on how you can become a fair chance inclusionary employer. The last thing I want to say before we, I want to save some time for question and answer, but the last idea that I want to put out on the table is it's not anything as concrete as working in prison, juries, employment. But it's another way of thinking about this moment that we're in. And I began this conversation by referencing a conversation that I had with my mom. And I couldn't step off the stage without making things equal in the family and telling you a story about a conversation that I had with my father. And it was a couple years before he passed away. And we had watched a movie together about the Civil Rights Movement. And when the movie ended, I asked him, what did you think about it? You were there. He said, I liked that they showed this history on film because more people watch movies than read books. As an author, I can absolutely tell you that that is true. 
He said, but here's what I didn't like. He said, I didn't like the way they made it seem like everybody was in the movement. It, it wasn't like that. We were few in number. He said, I used to go to college campuses to try to recruit people to join SNCC. And the college administrators would run me off campus. Now, those same colleges all have big murals celebrating the contributions that their students made to the movement. He said Martin Luther King was not popular when he died. True, Gallup poll. Martin Luther King had a two-thirds unfavorable rating a couple months before he passed away. The March on Washington, my dad said, was not popular when it happened. Roper did a national poll three months before the March on Washington. Here was the question. Do you think the planned march in Washington, D.C. will help or hurt the cause of the Negro? 60% of the people responded and said they think it will hurt. So Martin Luther King wasn't popular. The March on Washington wasn't popular. And now in Black History Month, all we get is Coca-Cola ads of Martin Luther King speaking at the March on Washington. My dad said, look, man, I am not telling you this because I want credit for being there first. That is not the point of the story. He said, the point of my telling you this is that I feel like the way that we present history of the civil rights movement is demoralizing to your generation. Because you call a meeting to work on your issue, and six people come, and five of them were at the last meeting, and you think, well, what's wrong with my cause? Everybody was at Selma. Everybody was marching in Montgomery. Everybody was in Birmingham and Albany. No, they weren't. So my dad was saying was this. He said, look, he said, when you are facing a entrenched, apparently immovable, insurmountable system, slavery, Jim Crow, I would say today mass incarceration, he said, people are going to tell you that changing it is impossible. He said, but here's the thing. If you ignore them, and you fight, and you march, mobilize, litigate, and you do change it, he said, those people aren't going to turn around and say that they were wrong. They're going to say, oh, yeah, I knew that. That, that was inevitable. And then they're going to make a movie about it. So I don't know what is the idea that is in this room that is more powerful than any I've shared for change. And I don't know who in this room is going to take it forward. But I know the idea is here, the group of people is here, working in community, you're here. And that one of you and some of you are going to take an idea and you're going to push it and you're going to fight and you're going to ignore the people that tell you that change is impossible. And you will come up with alternatives, and you will, and we will, tear down mass incarceration and replace it with something that heals and protects communities without all this toxic consequences of our current system. And when you do that, and your movie comes out, I'll be in the front row, popcorn in hand, cheering and thanking you for what you have done. So thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for coming here tonight um, to bring this message uh, to Northwest Connecticut, a very diverse community, as you can see. 
Uh, we need uh, the message everywhere. You need the message everywhere. Um, I think part of it is um, in terms, and this is not really a question, but commentary. I'm a former state representative, served for 17 years in the legislature, worked on these issues. Sure. And I can tell you how hard it is mm. um, to move forward. The problem is us. The representatives? A no. Or the white people? The pe people in general. Oh, got it. <laughs> um, right. Number one, people want um, legislators to be tough on crime. Mandatory sentencing. Uh, no education in prisons. Right. Um, if I ever, when I did advocate for education to be provided uh, in our, in our, from our colleges, um, that was considered an outrage because their kids had to pay for college and we were getting it free. Health care. They don't want health care for people in prisons um, because they get free health care. That's a huge, yeah. it's a major issue, the Yukon Health Center. I could go on and on. Um, but the bottom line is that we need to be more con cognizant of what's going on. You know, all the years I served, I did not hear from people um, on most of the issues like this that I worked on. Raise the age uh, was a huge issue, so children are not incarcerated. Um, so we do, we have so many policies that people support. Um, I remember I was working on a bill um, on um, excessive force by police officers against mostly coming from communities of color and that was considered anathema. Um, and some of my colleagues from New Haven um, and some Bridgeport and Hartford said to me, Roberta, you don't even want to go down this issue because it's so controversial. Um, let us fight this battle. But my point is that I think everyone in this room needs to be more aware of what's happening. Connecticut has the, one of the highest recidivism rates um, in the United States. And we need to be aware of that. And that's because that's what people in this state want. Uh, they want tough on crime. Um, and uh, anyway, I just, I'll stop there, but I think people need to be more aware of these issues. I thank the forum for bringing this to our community, but I hope we'll be, people will be more aware and do more uh, and be more supportive of leaders who want to come out on this issue. So thank you again very much. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, and when, when did you uh, step down from elected office? 2016. Yeah, yeah. So, and I really appreciate you sharing that because I do think that what you're sharing is, if not, the biggest, probably the biggest obstacle, certainly one of the biggest obstacles. And we all do what we can in different ra ways, like, ways, like right. one of the reasons when I think about like, okay, am I gonna leave my home? And I mean, this is an easy trip because you know it's an hour and a half drive to a beautiful part of the state, but am I gonna leave my home and like take a flight and go somewhere and be away from my son and not have dinner at home and not sleep in my own bed and I'm really gonna do this, and, one of the, and I say no a lot of the time, but when I say yes, what gets me out of the house and on the plane and through all of that is the fact that I want to try to change minds and change attitudes, and I think that we all, well, we can all, it's sort of my mom's point, right? Well, what am I gonna do? And so we all try to do our piece. I think that the point that you raise about sort of opposition is a very, very important one. And was it, so I, was, the, was the community that you, rep, what were the racial demographics of the community that you represented? Here, here. here. got it, okay, perfect. Yes, got it, You're, these are your people, got it. <laughs> so one of the things that I think has to change is that more and more people need to be willing to speak about the family members, direct family members, extended family members, 
that they had who have had some contact with the system, who are struggling or have struggled with addiction. If people, if everybody did, if I asked everybody to do a deep autobiography, and I asked everybody to think about whether there's somebody in their family who has been arrested or has been incarcerated, or is there somebody in their family, a child, a nephew, an uncle, who suffered from addiction and had that treated through a private network outside of the criminal system? Or is there some kid who struggled in school, who broke a rule, who was given a second chance, was not expelled, but where the parents were called in to talk about this. Has that ever happened in your life? And almost everybody in the room will say yes to that. Almost everybody in the room has had a direct experience or a close call with a system where if it had gone the other way, where if you hadn't had the resources to find a private treatment program, where if the school counselor hadn't called you in to tell you that your child or your niece or your nephew had done this and given a second chance, where if you had been poorer, with fewer resources, darker skin, you would have been more likely funneled or shuttled into the system, maybe never to come out. And so what people have to do is be more willing to talk about their direct experiences. We are now at the point where 50% of Americans has an extended, has an immediate or extended family member who has been incarcerated for some period of time. So this is no longer, it is yes, acutely concentrated in communities of color, absolutely. But it's not limited there anymore. And I see this all the time in, the, in Connecticut, the, my classes. Connecticut's prisons are about 40% white. So we are disproportionately incarcerating black and Latino, yes, yes. But we incarcerate plenty of white people in this state. They are mostly poor. They've mostly been suffering from some sort of trauma that they never got treatment, often is from for addiction, mental illness, otherwise. What we have to do, I believe, to change the politics that you just mentioned, is all of those people need to start speaking up about this issue. You said you never heard from people, but they're there. They're there, and they may not have come. They may, may not have spoken up. They may not have been willing to publicly out themselves and identify and suffer the shame and the stigma that comes with being speaking up publicly and saying, my son was arrested. My son is a drug addict. And until we cultivate that kind of coming out of the closet, if you will, then it is still going to be wrapped in this shame, this si silent stigma. And you're still going to be able to go to Hartford and have people say, oh, that's a New Haven problem. That's a Bridgeport problem. That's a Hartford problem. Yeah, it's a problem in those cities. But it's not just that. It is a problem all over this state. And we've got to get people to be willing to embrace and understand that, to be able to change the attitudes in the way that you have exactly pointed out need to change. My next responses will be shorter. <laughs> Professor, um, thank you very much for, thank you. for taking the time to come here to, uh, to Salisbury. Um, one of the things that's always puzzled me was really the, the sort of, uh, how did this whole thing start? And you helped us understand this, uh, certainly during the 60s and the 70s and the Clinton administration, yes. black on black crime and the response to it to build more prisons um, certainly is obviously part of the issue, 
drug addiction is part of the issue, although it's not completely, by any chance, the cause of many people in prison today. The disintegration of the black family, to what degree does, is that a factor? You know, I remember reading the Moynihan Report back in the 60s. And is that something that could have a major impact? And in terms of the folks that are in prison, the people who are incarcerated, as you just pointed out, are from the lower quintile of the economic distribution. Mm. And to what degree would, let's say, additional income, whether in the form of additional entitlements, income supplements. In other words, I'm looking for other things than the just let's, let's create more jails. What can we do to help our fellow brothers and sisters not repeat the same thing again? Well, you're all the things you said. Every single thing that you said would be an important and welcome contribution. Every single uh, one of them. So this, in my view, this is a problem that has, you know, a thousand or more causes, and it's a, a problem that's going to require a thousand or more responses. And so every single one of those you interventions you identified, whether it's supporting families in family formation and family stability, whether, it, whether it's income, uh, whether it's jobs, which we both talked about, uh, they are all going to be crucial pieces of uh, a collective response. So what I always tell, because I get this, you know, a lot of times I get a version of your question, I get a lot of times from students, right, who they're in my criminal law class or they know I work on these issues, and they come to me and they say, you know, what, what should I do? Uh, what should I do in response to this problem? What kind of lawyer should I be or what kind of policy? And they'll run down a list of possibilities. And the truth is, I mean, every once in a while somebody has something that I'm like, ooh, that's a bad idea. Like, let's not do that. That'll make it worse. But most of the time, their proposed interventions are good ones. And so what I always say to them is, all those things you mentioned would make a difference. I can't give you the right answer. And there is no right answer. But there is a right answer for you. There is a piece of this work that you can tackle that speaks to your passions, your love, your skills, your interests, your desires. And so... I feel like in terms of the responses that you just mentioned, that whichever of those either you find most compelling right now or in community with other people in the audience you want to get together and go to Hartford and push for, we need you. It would make a difference. Thank you. <coughs> Could you please briefly give us uh, your view of what the um, <coughs> criminal justice reform efforts have been in Washington and is there any reason for hope there and your understanding of the politics? Uh, just a brief answer, please. Yeah, uh, brief. Um, the legislation that passed is called the First Step Act and it's just what the title suggests. It's a first step, and it has made a difference. But it's a very, very small first step. The biggest obstacle and the biggest opponent to criminal justice reform in D.C. was Jeff Sessions when, he's a, when he was attorney general. The fact that he's no longer the attorney general, I mean, whatever you think about Barr versus Sessions in other dimensions, um, Bill Barr hasn't prioritized fighting criminal justice reform efforts to the same extent that Jeff Sessions did. So got, got, that gives me a little tiny bit of hope. But my bottom line is that Washington is a tiny part of this problem. So again, a thousand, we need to work on all fronts. But with 12% of the, California and Texas together have more prisoners than 
our federal system uh, in its entirety. Um, okay, we'll have uh, one more question, please, before we tie it up. And then, of course, there are books in the lobby to, to I'll purchase. I'll take the last question. Um, is James Comey, former director of the FBI, knew a thing or two about crime statistics. He told Barack Obama directly he had a problem with the phrase mass incarceration. Every single person who was incarcerated was charged, appeared, had a public defender or a defender, and was incarcerated one at a time. That's not mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is what's going on in Xinjiang province in China, where you round up 100,000 people at a time, no questions asked, and you treat them all the same way. Maybe you ought to think about using a phrase other than mass incarceration because it makes people feel guilty about the fact that they're not incarcerated and they must have done something wrong to incarcerate those people who are. Your reaction? So I disagree with James Comey about many things, uh, and uh, this is one. I think that he's wrong. Um, and I think that he's, he is correct. That is to say, your description of how people are processed um, is generally true, but I think what mass incarceration as a term is trying to capture is what happens when a system becomes so punitive and so massive that huge segments of American society that swaths of neighborhoods are targeted for aggressive policing, for stop and frisk, where people are pulled over. In a city like Washington, D.C., for example, which I know best, but this story can be told in lots of places, uh, the police department does very aggressive pretext stop policing. So these are where they use any pretext of a broken uh, traffic law to pull you over. And they're not really, they're not enforcing the traffic laws. That's not their point. They want to search the car. And they use that style of policing. In DC, for example, under Eric Holder, it was to go after guns. That was the stated purpose of it. And getting guns w when, this, when violence is high, that's not by itself a problem. But here's the problem, and it's one of the things I write about in the book. If you do that, and you only do that in the low-income parts of the city, the result of that is that you capture many, many people for low-level drug offenses, for possession of marijuana, for possession of cocaine. And so what you do is you move massive numbers of people into our jail. Meanwhile, across town, not even all, you don't even have to go all the way from New Haven to Litchfield County. You can just go a mile across town in Washington, D.C., and there's neighborhoods full of, because I know, because they're my friends, lawyers and doctors and bankers and other folks who have marijuana in their car, but they're never stopped, they're never pulled over, they're never arrested, and they never end up being incarcerated. So what mass incarceration is trying to get at is that we are taking massive numbers of low income disproportionately, people of di dis color disproportionately, though not exclusively, and we are channeling them and funneling them into a prison system that denies them educational opportunities because we don't allow people to go to class in prison. I just talked about that. And then make sure that that is a lifetime of punishment because when you get out, you're not able to get back into the employment system. That, that at a community-wide level is massive. And if we want to call it massive incarceration because of mass incarceration, I'm cool with that. But we got to get something that captures the magnitude of the collective problem that we have created and that is our collective obligation to address. Thank you very much. Thank you.